Hello, brothers and sisters in arms. This is Eric from Dead Tech here with you. And today I am going to be doing another in the installment of my reader question roundups. This is the 12th installment in a series where you ask me questions and then I answer the questions. Uh, so yeah, that's how this typically works. Today's uh, set of questions is actually interesting because they came in sequence in response to a blog post that I did that will kind of tie three of them together. So assuming I have the time to get through four, it's going to be three that are all about niching, uh, too narrow a niche, too broad, how to pick one, how I learned about uh, that topic, etc. And then the other question that I have here is unrelated, but it's kind of interesting and it's about the idea of a software code of ethics or a software professional code of ethics. So if any of that sounds like it might be interesting to you, stay tuned. All right, so first up, we have a question about the aforementioned idea of a series of, or a, a code of ethics, if you will, for software developers. And this arose out of a blog post that I'll show you here and have a link in the description, um, but that I kind of wrote about the idea that I don't really think software is a profession. Now, I actually wound up writing two blog posts about that topic because there was so much feedback and discussion. So I'm not going to rehash all of that here, but suffice it to say, I kind of came at it from this idea that I don't really think of uh, software development as a profession. I think of it as more of a business tactic um, you could read those posts if you really want to dive into it, but um, in support of that argument, I cited some definitions in and around like the idea of a profession uh, claiming that software not only isn't one, but that it shouldn't be one. Um, and one of those things um, that's kind of directly relevant is uh, whether there's like a governing board um, and another one is whether there's a specific like accreditation and validation required. Uh, those things are true of professions, but not of software. So what came out of this was a comment uh, on one of these posts where the reader um, asked me, uh, expressed, uh, you know, liking the post. Hello, Eric, this is a good one, meaning the post. Um, there is a third argument for development as a profession, which is about ethics, and I'd like to read your take on that. Uh, well, this is a video, so you're going to have to listen, I suppose. You could transcribe it. Um, but anyway, uh, then there are two articles cited here. One is from Uncle Bob Martin that talks about the idea of software kind of um, contributing to a plane crash. And the other one is about the Volkswagen emissions scandal, wherein, to the best of my recollection, some software engineers basically helped Volkswagen run some game on emission standard tests uh, to make the cars pass emissions testing when, when they wouldn't otherwise have done so. Um, so that's what the question is about. Should we have a, um, a software code of ethics, if you will? All right, so let's answer that. First of all, um, I feel like the question of whether it should or not has to be kind of separated into the idea of the pragmatic and theoretical. So from a pragmatic perspective, it's super hard for me to imagine this ever actually happening. There are something like uh, 20 million worldwide software developers. Software developers, unlike uh, other professions like haircutting or being an electrician, you can't do those things remotely. So it's pretty easy to subject them to kind of a local board or uh, what have you, kind of like uh, civically based accreditation. Uh, software development, um, I could easily commission this from literally anywhere in the world uh, right now. So it gets wildly infeasible to have a software code of ethics since it's such a global um, industry. And then secondly, I'm going to um, cite the venerable XKCD here. Uh, this is talking about standards, but the idea is uh, we already kind of have probably a lot of people with a lot of ideas around ethics in and around software. If we kind of tried to create another one, we would just have like yet another series of ideas. So uh, the fragmentation in the comic is especially apt here. Uh, can you imagine 20 million software developers throughout the world ever agreeing on a single code of ethics? Because I sure can't. It's the first one you are out of order. You're out of order. You're out of order. The whole trial is out of order. Now, even in theory, I guess setting that aside, let's assume that we could come up with something like that for the time being. Um, so that then there would be the theoretical idea of a software code of ethics. Would that be valuable or would that be something that we should strive for? Uh, and to be perfectly honest with that, I, I don't even think it's something really to strive for. So, like, let's take a look at the uh, examples here that we're talking about. 
uh, first of all, the, the Volkswagen scandal, is that really a software ethical issue? The fact that software engineers basically uh, participated in what I'll just describe as cheating, uh, I don't know that that's unique to software. Right now, there's a big thing um, in U.S. sports related to the Houston Astros and Boston Red Sox, recent World Series champions, uh, also cheating. Um, does that mean we need a baseball code of ethics or a athlete code of ethics? Or do we maybe just, you know, say that ethically good behavior is don't cheat or don't commit frauds or don't do things that are illegal? And then for the example that uh, Bob Martin cited with an uh, airplane crash, uh, which was contributed to, he speculates, I, I don't know how all this eventually settled out. When he wrote the article, he did, he admitted, I don't really fully know what happens or happened, but here's what I think is a likely scenario uh, that these kind of programming errors and different things contributed eventually to this plane crash. So even taking that at face value, assuming he's right about what contributed, um, let's assume it was faulty, poorly conceived of software. Is that uh, something that a software code of ethics would solve? Um, are the quality assurance people maybe somewhat culpable here? Is, is the management culpable? Um, is it just the software engineers? Or is it maybe that what happened here was poorly designed or insufficiently tested stuff went out there and created a problem? And so when you, when, when you start to look at these things this way, it seems almost like narcissistic to say, well, what this really needs is a software code of ethics. Like, you know, that we as the people doing software are going to kind of white knight in here and and solve all of the world's problems with some kind of software code of ethics. Uh, is that really like what needs to happen? Or should we just as people who participate in software or, or really anything to some degree or another, try to abide by like a reasonable personal and professional set of ethics that maybe should be common to all of us. Uh, don't cheat if you're going to be putting people's lives in jeopardy or have really high stakes stuff that you're working on. Make sure that you're testing it and doing a lot of traceable diligence on it, etc. Uh, so my take on the idea of a software code of ethics, number one, um, it would be wildly impractical. Number two, I have a hard time seeing that it's necessary or beneficial. Uh, so no, I, I don't think that that's something I would get down on personally. All right, now for the second question, and we're moving into the uh, topics about a niche phase of things here. This question is basically, how do you know if a niche is too broad or uh, too focused on the other hand? And so let's take a look at the actual reader question. This is another one that was a comment on my blog. This one in particular was in response to a blog post I wrote um, that I will, uh, show you which is about niching and I'll also have a link in the description below. So here's the question. How do you know if your niche is too broad or too focused? For most of my career I was tasked with turning conv convoluted Excel documents into actual documented business practices where half that documentation is in the form of a report suite. It's a challenging it's a challenge sorting through social status jockeying BS, but that seems a little broad. Translating Excel sheets into web applications sounds a bit tech specialized too, and it feels like I'm thinking like a cog instead of like an opportunist. As an aside, um, if you've watched these videos before, you might know those terms. If you read my blog, you definitely do, or the term opportunist. Uh, that's from a blog post and also from my book, Developer Gemini. I'll have links about that if you want to read more. Um, so moving on, does uh, I can make your data actually useful and actionable sound like something a small restaurant chain, for example, would buy? Okay, so to recap here, is the niche too narrow or too broad? And let's take a look in general uh, at this question. So first of all, um, does I can make your data useful and actionable sound like something a small restaurant chain would buy? Um, to answer that question, first and foremost, no, but you might be doing something they would buy. So for instance, um, do you just need better phrasing? Like what data are we actually talking about here? Uh, off the cuff, if, um, if it were something like, you know, can I take your, uh, time stamped, uh, you know, cash register or sales based data, or I can take your time stamped and cash uh, sales based data and turn that into a prediction engine for where the best place to open a new uh, instance of your chain would be. I think that's super valuable. And I think that that is neither too broad nor too narrow. 
And I think that you would actually have a great business right there if the idea were, hey, do you own a series of, you know, three or four or whatever local chain restaurants, you know, not too big, not too small. Um, I can take the data from those restaurants and help you predict where to open your next restaurant. I think you would have people lining up for that business. Uh, so, uh, you know, it depends on what this data is that we're talking about. But um, I don't know that that niche in general is too broad or too narrow. It's probably a good one. Um, so zooming out a little, like let's generalize to the idea of when a niche is too narrow or when a niche is too broad. And I would say that a niche is too broad when it fails to trigger um, what Jonathan Stark calls a Rolodex moment. Um, I'll have a link uh, to his channel uh, in the description, but the Rolodex moment that he defines is if you're at a cocktail party or something and you're describing what it is you do, does that trigger anyone to say, hey, I know somebody that you should talk to or not? And so for instance, take the example I just cited. If you were at a cocktail party and you said, hey, um, I actually make this piece of software and um, using that, I have this service where uh, I can help people that own small restaurant franchising or small restaurant chains figure out where to open the next franchise. Uh, somebody at the cocktail party could very well be like, oh, my cousin Nick actually uh, owns a chain with like three restaurants. I bet he'd be super interested in that. Welcome to Good Burger, home of the Good Burger. Can I take your order? That is a Rolodex moment where I know who you can help and, and, and I know how to make that happen. If, on the other hand, you were at that same cocktail party and you were just saying, oh, yeah, um, you know, I help, uh, you know, people who are interested in predicting f um, like future instances of where they can open their business using machine learning. Now people are probably going to kind of stare at you blankly like, who do you help? I don't. You know, I, I guess that sounds useful, but it kind of like whoosh will go right over their head. That's when you're too broad. I mean, like the epitome of too broad is if you go to a lot of sort of like miscellaneous agencies and you look at like their mission statement and it's like, we help, you know, build brand awareness or something. That, that's not going to trigger any kind of Rolodex moment. So that's too broad when people don't really, they can't really conceive of who it is you help and how you help them. Too narrow, on the other hand, um... That is a much more pragmatic thing in my mind. If you're too narrow, people can definitely conceive. They can have those Rolodex moments in theory, but they don't have any Rolodex moments because they don't know anyone. It's like an empty set of people who are doing what we're talking about. So like go back to the, um, I think, interesting business idea of helping predict where the next franchise of a local restaurant would go. Maybe you have niched in even further and say like, yeah, I, you know, I help um, people do that, but only if it's a restaurant um, that sells barbecue and that also sells mittens to their customers, right? Like that's super specific. I can tell you I don't have money, but what I do have are a very particular set of skills. So if you knew anyone that was a barbecue restaurant chain slash mitten retailer, uh, that would be perfect. But that's not a thing, the, what I just said. So uh, that's probably too narrow. Um, so to kind of get back to what we're talking about here in terms of the reader question, um, I think that you need to tighten up what you're doing just a little bit in terms of like what data, like what is it you're actually um, helping with? And then you can judge for yourself if it's too narrow or too broad based on, is this going to trigger an, a Rolodex moment? If yes, then good. And will there be anyone for whom it triggers a Rolodex moment? And if the answer to the both of those is uh, yes, if if you are going to trigger a Rolodex moment and you're going to trigger a Rolodex moment in actuality for businesses that exist, then you're in kind of that Goldilocks niche zone. All right, for the third question, this is kind of um, specific uh, niche advice. So for a coach is um, helping uh, helping companies add features to their old software faster, a good niche. And I mean a, a software development coach. So let me go here and actually read the reader question. Um, Hi, Eric. Thanks a lot for your blog. You're welcome. Uh, I found this post particularly interesting. Again, a link to that post in the description. He says, I have a question of my own. I am currently a technical coach at a company. I help teams deal with legacy code. I mostly do code kata and mob programming sessions about refactoring. There's a lot more to say, but that's a good summary. Here is my question. Do you think that helping companies add features to their old software faster is a good niche idea? 
I feel like that's still a bit too labor, as you would say. What do you think? All right, so um, first of all, I think that that's actually a decent niche uh, coaching and the way you've described it here. So um, specifically the bit about like kind of older existing software that would trigger kind of a Rolodex moment or, uh, among like VPs or mid-level managers. Like, yeah, I got some old software and sure seems we've encountered some feature slowdown. Uh, so Rolodex moment there, that that's um, a set of people you can help with. Um, it might be hard at the cocktail party because that requires a level of insight into uh, what that VP or mid-level manager is doing that the layperson might not have, but at least that VP or mid-level manager upon encountering you will say, oh yeah, you're describing my situation. I do have feature slowdown um, with this kind of aging software and I could use some help with that. So the niche here I don't think is really the problem, but software coaching, coaching software developers, which by the way is something I've done uh, for stints of my career, it's a pretty hard business to pursue as an independent um, entity. It's not impossible, but it's difficult. And it's not difficult specifically because of the niche. It's difficult because number one, um, what you're doing, you know, I can help uh, this aging software, you know, I can come in and do stuff with your team to help uh, get you features faster, is something that everybody in software is going to claim from project managers to scrum masters to like every developer on your team. All of them are going to be in there saying, oh yeah, you know, I like legacy code, that's something I've worked with, and I've got this whole system, I know design patterns, or I know project management techniques. So you have a good value proposition, but it's something that like everyone's going to also claim that they also have, whether they're contractors, employees, consultants, like everybody's kind of going in there and because it, it's sort of nebulous, like, right, like I can help the software team be better. Um, and software coaching in general, setting even that aside, is a tough space to be in just because it has so many uh, tactical sales problems that are going to prevent you from getting in front of a buyer of this service and convincing them, number one, that they need the service, number two, that you can provide and, and scratch that itch, and number three, to kind of tie the whole thing together and pull the trigger. And like, here's what I mean. Uh, first of all, it is almost impossible to quantify the return from a software coaching effort. So if you look back and you're trying to make a case study based on your previous uh, instances of software coaching, what does that look like? Uh, the team was struggling and then they weren't? Are you the only variable in that equation? Like almost certainly not. Um, is there anything quantified? Like if you go back and re-audit all those times you came in as a software coach, probably the only thing you're really gonna have is testimonials from individuals on the team that were like, hey, you know, Eric was just wonderful as a coach. I really had the light bulb come on and I feel like I'm working a lot faster. Like that's the best case scenario. What you're not gonna have is a case study that's like, yeah, you know, I saved this department uh, 300K over the course of a month and they only had to pay me, you know, 20K for that month or whatever. Uh, you're going to have a really hard time making that uh, case. And then in terms of sales in general, you have a buyer gatekeeper situation. So the beneficiary of this service of coaching is the software developers, you know, ostensibly um, they like you, but the person making the purchase uh, they're not really benefiting from it. They're only benefiting from it if the software developers that like and respect you become more productive and good things happen. But they're kind of making this purchase for someone else. So the pain dream fix that you can ad address in a good sales conversation doesn't exist with this buyer. So the buyer um, uh, doesn't benefit directly. And this sort of contributes to another problem, which is that something that's ancillary like coaching uh, is going to be viewed by a lot of organizations as fluff. And it's the first thing to get eliminated. So if there's any kind of downturn, your whole practice probably evaporates pretty quickly because when belt tightening happens industry-wide, I don't think anybody's going to be like hiring coaches. So you're kind of SOL there. Uh, and then add to all of this the fact that there are an awful lot of people in the, you know, agile or software coaching space that are just hucksters. Quiet down, people. My name is Mr. Abignail. That's Abignail, not Abignali, not Abignaley, but Abignail. And so people, if they get burned by this type of thing, are gonna paint you with that same brush, even if you are not one. So that's a lot of stuff working against you that doesn't really have a lot to do with 
uh, niche. So is it a good niche? Kind of the way you've defined it. Um, it's decent. I might tighten it up just a little bit instead of just like a help existing um, uh, or kind of pieces of like aging or existing software. I help features get delivered faster. The beginning of that is good because you're identifying something there. Um, but maybe you could tighten up like what you're doing. Like I, I help um, organizations with COBOL code bases or something, you know, that would tighten it up a bit. And then on the other end, deliver features faster. Like, nah, uh, maybe I help people with COBOL uh, code bases or people still on mainframes um, get to, you know, a modern tech. Like I, if you've got a COBOL mainframe, I am absolutely used to helping old, um, or sorry, I, I don't mean to be ageist, but probably old, uh, COBOL developers. Uh, I'm, hel I'm good at porting that code base to something like Java and helping those developers come along for the ride. So there, it's not so much coaching. You're, you are coaching, but you're bringing them along and you're creating an outcome. Like you had this COBOL code base, now you have a Java code base for the win. So um, it's a decent niche. I think you could tune it to be a better one that's kind of less fragile for like market downturns and difficulty in sales. All right, on to the fourth question. This one concerns me uh, personally, and it was actually, it's from the same reader. Uh, we got into a series uh, of email exchanges, and he later on asked um, kind of about me personally, like how did I come by all this knowledge? So the question here is, I have tried my own side hustle in the past, and I'm using an entrepreneur model internally um, at the company uh, to spread my coaching. That seems a bit weak though. The business side of this niche scares me a bit. I'm wondering if I can realistically upskill on required business topics. What do you think? Uh, is this a good niche? Did you have to come up, did you have to upskill on business topics in the past and was it difficult? So um, this is part of an email in the context of the back and forth here is this last bit is asking me, Eric, um, like how I came about this knowledge, how I came to be in this position, uh, what's happened with my own business travels. All right, so first of all, how did I come into this knowledge in general? Like, how did I get to where I am? And I will say that I blundered into it. And everyone's in on it, including her. Uh, so a lot of trial and error, a lot of mistakes, um, et cetera. I have been completely on my own for, gosh, approaching six years now. Um, and that started off with kind of like boomeranging my last full-time employer into a client. And it was a combination of moonlighting before that and picking up kind of ad hoc contracts, a lot of subcontracting, uh, then eventually consulting, and when I think about all the things I did, it was just kind of like opportunistically flailing around doing progressively more profitable things that seemed more and more in demand, but there wasn't a ton of intentionality behind it. So for six years, I just kind of opportunistically did things that came up, learned as I went along and started to cobble that into genuine knowledge. Um, but one thing I'll say about myself is through the course of doing all that, I was um, number one, as I said, very opportunistic. But number two, I learned and listened uh, a lot with an emphasis on the listening part. So when I would engage, I would genuinely listen and hear what people wanted. And instead of kind of maintaining this steadfast focus on like what I wanted to do and what tech stacks and what type of work and this and that, I would listen to what people actually needed. And maybe like if I had wanted to say do a coaching engagement, I did one or two of those. And then if a third thing came up where it was like, well, we don't quite need coaching, but maybe you could do some training, I was game. So instead of um, saying, well, no, I really, you know, this is just what I do. Uh, in the beginning, when I didn't necessarily um, have a well-defined and established value proposition, um, I was willing to try things and kind of learn and listen. So um, I had that going for me. Uh, but if I'm going to summarize how I kind of went from sort of thrashing around being a little more generalized without a niche to what I have now, which is a very niched, very specific consulting practice that I only anymore do through word of mouth and a very niched, very specialized content marketing business that I'm growing. Um, how did I get there? What did I learn? What kind of skills did I develop? 
Um, let me think. So, uh, I guess first and foremost, I would say I consumed a lot of books, podcasts, audiobooks, uh, blog posts, et cetera, on the topic. And this isn't that I sat down for like three months and just said, I'm going to read, you know, I'm going to fill up my cart and read all these recommendations. It was just more that um, I would consume these while I was on work trips um, or I would, you know, listen to books that were uh, directly relevant to what I was doing. So when I first started to get kind of management consulting gigs and I was being asked, you know, uh, how do we build an org chart or, you know, how do I improve morale in my group? I would go out and like actively um, find, you know, books on those topics and listen to them and prep for those engagements. Um, so it was kind of a mixture of opportunistic learning and cramming learning, if you will, but I consumed a lot of media and I made a point of doing that on an ongoing basis. Um, let's see, uh, practice. So I've now founded three different LLCs. Well, I guess five, if you count going to different States. Um, so that taught me a lot about general business topics like bookkeeping, invoicing, um, legal and taxes, that type of stuff, contracts. Uh, so if you're looking to kind of acquire this type of business knowledge, uh, more on the business end of things than say the niche, um, uh, found a business. It's great practice. I actually wrote a blog post once where I really encourage that. Just dive in and do it. Um, I'll have that below in the uh, description. So that's a way that I've done it. Uh, with positioning, so with, with the learning I mentioned earlier, um, I was always uh, willing to adjust my positioning, especially in the early going. You know, whether it's from coaching to management, consulting, you know, the different ways that I was willing to evolve, I was willing to learn and adapt my positioning. And that kind of led me from miscellaneous app dev to more of a focus on coaching and, you know, I guess miscellaneous consulting, which started to turn into kind of like training coaching. Then eventually that became general management consulting, which eventually evolved into uh, the code base assessment practice I had, this very data driven. I'll assess your code base. And that happened sort of organically through subcontracting my own business, et cetera, over the course of like three years. Um, just as I started to think more and more about the positioning, positioning myself as an expert, and that I learned that um, kind of it wasn't just like general TDD or general like knowledge. It was my knowledge of like static analysis and um, data-driven code base assessments and data-driven assessments of software organizations that was my real differentiator. So um, evolving that positioning to, you know, I don't do dev, I don't do miscellaneous coaching, I don't do general um, consulting anymore. It's really kind of coalescing around this uh, data-driven uh, code base assessment practice. So evolving my positioning to kind of get to that point is another way that uh, I've gotten here. Making a lot of mistakes. So uh, if what I just described sounds like a very indirect route to where I got with my code base assessment practice, that's certainly true. Um, I did a lot of dead ends, blind alleys, etc. cetera. Um, be open to that. Like if, if the market isn't having what you're selling, um, understand that, uh, you know, you can't force it. So learn from your mistakes and move on. Um, and I guess maybe the last thing I'll mention uh, in, in service of hit subscribe, the content business over the last few years, that business involves di working directly with marketing departments for all kinds of tech organizations. So I guess I can't really understate how much it's helped me to strategically work with probably 30 plus different marketing organizations on marketing those businesses, which has taught me a lot just about the industry, about positioning, about the different kind of things that the market wants. And that's been super valuable as well. So uh, that might not have been the most coherent answer I've ever given, but like, it's kind of hard to do a lot of polish on my own experience. Um, and, you know, as an avowed introvert, well, avowed is the wrong word, I guess, as, as a big time introvert, like talking about myself is a little weird. So I get a little manic, but hopefully that's interesting. Kind of the story of how I've acquired over the last six years, um, all of this knowledge about niches and stuff. All right, that's going to do it. And this time I finally did what any good programmer would do. It just took me 12 episodes, but I've actually recorded uh, my stock outro where I talk about, you know, liking and subscribing and all that stuff. Um, it's about time I made that its own thing. So I didn't have to keep, you know, doing it. It's like the video equivalent of copy and paste code. So stay tuned for that.
Thank you for watching that reader question roundup. I do appreciate you tuning into these videos. If you would like to ask a reader question, you can do so at deadtech.com slash ask. I will also have a link to that down in the description so you can go there right from this page. If you like this video, it'd be great if you could give me a like. It's not just fluff, it like actually does help the channel. Um, and if you liked it enough that you want to subscribe, I encourage you to do so. If you're going to do that, maybe click the bell down below because that will give you an email each time a new video is posted to the channel. And I'll say what I have always said, which is that if you don't like, you know, feel free to give it a thumbs down. I am looking for feedback in whatever form it comes, whether it's comments, likes, dislikes, however you want to engage is, of course, your business. So with that, I will say thanks again for watching and I will catch you next time.